fusion energy is safe in the sense that we're talking about releasing a small amount of neutrons compared to, to fission, compared to classical nuclear energy. So it's technically safer. And there's since there's no cascading effect, since we don't have that cascade that we cause for nuclear fusion, re or, uh, sorry, nuclear fission reactions, A-bomb reactions, we can just turn it off whenever we want. Let me repeat this. This is huge. Why is it safe compared to a nuclear reactor? In a nuclear reactor, we're afraid of a meltdown. We're afraid of a runaway. We're afraid of a runaway reaction where it's going to boom, blow up, what have you. But in fusion, all you have to do is hit the switch and turn it off. The moment you stop feeding the fusion reaction, it's going to die off. Kind of like keeping a little fire alive, right? Keeping a little fire alive at the campfire. You wake up the next morning, there's a few smoldering coals. You keep it, burn it, right? Now, I think that a fusion reaction, if we were able to make one that's on the scale of a black hole, then I think you do have a runaway concern. But nobody here, definitely not David Kirkley, are talking about creating black holes. They're talking about energy production on a much smaller scale than that. If we were able to make a black hole, I think that's where we would start to look at Q factors in the thousands, millions, maybe infinite, essentially. But uh, at that point, I mean, we don't know. We don't know. Oh, yeah. Here's how nuclear fusion works. I do want to watch a little bit of this. So David Kirkley knows a lot, guys. I have to point out that he goes through kind of the history of inertial confinement fusion and how laser fusion separated from uh, magneto inertial fusion and the subtle differences, as we suspected, they're all pretty much the same thing. They're all the same underlying concept, but they have slight derivations in terms of how they approach it. And it's very interesting because he's going to say here, but just in case I don't uh, play the clip, that when they did laser fusion, they discovered something new about plasma. They discovered something new about plasma. And what they discovered was field reverse configuration field reverse configuration okay let's listen to a bit inertial fusion what you're trying to do is bring together and push together by a variety of means physical means those particles you push them together the most common is called laser inertial fusion our colleagues at the national ignition facility did this really well and made world records in the last few years for being able to demonstrate you can do this and do it at scale where you take very high power laser lasers and pulse them together to combine them to do fusion for a pulse for a very short period of time nanoseconds billionths of a second the other extreme, and you mentioned tokamaks and stellarators. Stellarators are actually my favorite. So we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about those. Graduate student in fusion, the stellarator is the first thing you learn about mm -hmm. because there's a mathematical solution for a stellarator that solves perfectly. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, and you can write it out and you can solve it. And analytically, it's very simple. Building one is very hard. And so it's taken uh, humanity a, a, a number of decades to be able to build stellarators. And we can do it now um, with the Windelstein 7X that came online uh, in the last few years being the premier uh, stellarator in the world. I should say all the different ways to do fusion. So I think I've also learned what's going on in terms of like people say, and, and rightfully there's good questions to be asked, which are like, Ashton, how, if they've figured this out, how is it, been, how can we don't have it right now? Right. The number one question is if they figured out fusion with the H bomb, the sixties were a long time ago. Why are we just now getting fusion online in 2025 why is helium energy the one to do this why didn't it happen in 2000 1990s partially the material science partially because what did i just say early on we need magnetic fields that are extremely powerful we didn't have them we didn't have high super high temperature high magnetic field strength super electromagnets whatever we needed right the other part of it is that he is kind of, he is actually like part of getting this out to the public. The They've been slowly researching it over time, getting better at it. And the government wasn't the one doing it. It had to come from the private sector. So there had to be this whole process of, okay, these people know about it. And now they're going to go try to commercialize it. And they had to get blessed, you know, by the government uh, as well. So a lot of this goes back to the government labs and the people that worked on the government labs. It goes back to the initial funding was from the Department of Energy. He even says in this that 
most of the initial research came from SIBRs. Those are the government defense contracts that they give to engineers. So we, I think we are watching it play out. And their research, Helium Fusion, he says in this interview, for the first time I had never seen anywhere else, that their first reactor started in 2003. 2003. So Helium Fusion has been doing this for decades. And this also lines up the MH370 videos quite nicely. Because... It goes to show that these people were working on it, but it's clearly being developed and advanced. And in the same window that that plane disappeared, where we're seeing three plasma orbs spinning around the plane, clearly with this open magnetic field structure with no confinement on them. The galaxy, galactic cosmic rays and solar particles that are, would come to Earth, that magnetic field, when you run a compass, you see the magnetic field from the Earth. So we know it's happening. It's all over. But how we generate it with electric currents is a little bit different and what we do is that we have a loop of, of wire and the simplest way to think about it is literally a round loop so something i wanted to point out here i'm going to skip ahead a, a couple of minutes um he talks about the, the earth right it's like the inspiration is look at the magnetic field lines of the earth look at the magnetic field lines of the sun in fact we can see the magnetic reconnection occur when we see these plasma arcs shoot out from the sun we know that we can magnetically confine plasma. How do we know it? We're looking at a ball of plasma every single day out there, magnetically confined. There's no container around the sun. And it's in a spherical shape, which should tell us that the equilibrium for that system is a sphere. It's a sphere. Look, we see spheres everywhere. So just to help people out, a toroidal shape, a toroidal plasma is a ring, a donut, a donut. And a poloidal, poloidal magnetic field, not toroidal, but poloidal with a P, is flip that, uh, flip that horizontally and, and draw your magnetic field lines around it, just like you would with the Earth. Just like what you would with the Earth. A poloidal magnetic field produces a spherical shape. Okay. Let me go ahead like one minute here. And then we're going to watch most of this, I think. Oh, um, yeah. There's like... There's like a 10 minute rant that we're going to watch here. So if you guys think I'm skipping ahead here, I'm mostly just skipping ahead because I, I want to minimize how much we're watching in a, in a long run here with electricity going around it. And you have a magnetic field inside of it. And then you have a test particle, a charged particle, an electron or an ion, which is if you imagine to generate this, I have a coil with electrons moving around it. But if I put one in the middle of it in this magnetic field, some really interesting things happen. That electron or that ion, that charged particle is what's called magnetized. And what magnetized means is that it's trapped on that field line. In fact, even really more interesting is that it oscillates around that field line. And so the way I think about this is if you think about the Earth's magnetosphere again, and you think about the charged particles, the aurora, the, the northern lights, is a charged particle trapped in the Earth's magnetic field going around there the Earth's are. magnetic field. And in the same way in fusion, we do the same thing here on Earth, but in a smaller direction where we trap these particles on magnetic fields, and they can go around and stay trapped to that magnetic field line. Trapped in the magnetic field, guys. That's the answer. That's the answer. The issues with plasma, with fusion, one issue is temperature. We solve that high magnetic field. Higher magnetic field causes higher temperature, more fusion reactions to occur. Get the highest magnetic field strength that you can get. Number one issue. Number two issue, control, confinement of the plasma. How do you make your plasma confined when it wants to shoot out in every direction, guys? How do you do that? Spin it around, get it to move, get it to vibrate. All the things that we've been learning about for the last two years. Get it to act in sync. Get it to line up. He says the magnetic field lines, the electrons will get trapped. They'll get trapped. The reason why the bubbles in MH370, the videos, the orbs, we call them, I guess. The reason why, why do they look so stable? The orbs look so stable. It almost just looks like a little snow globe moving around, but it's flying through the sky. Shouldn't it get, get getting blown in every different direction? No, because the magnetic field lines are locking in the charged particles, locking it in there. In fact, it's almost identical to if we were to look, if we were to look at the, um, the tokamak, the tokamak reactor, there's a video of the tokamak reactor. You can see the plasma spinning around and it's very faint. You can see a little bit of plasma. You see a little bit of glow. 
we're looking at a much denser version of that. The more dense the plasma is, the thicker it's going to look. And that's the secret as well. It's three factors. Temperature, uh, there's a constant, Boltzmann constant, and then there's also the amounts of particles. The more you get, the more dense they're going to be. So remember, dense plasma focus. That was one of the papers that was um, connected to this uh, plasma fusion propulsion. Is this fundamentally now an engineering problem or is there a new physics to be discovered about how the system is behaving? In, in fusion, the physics we're using is actually quite old, that the fundamental electromagnetic physics is 1800s physics. The fundamental atomic physics is early 1900s. And so the, the fundamental physics of how these work is very well understood. Putting them all together into a power plant, that's hard. And so you can do the math. You can do the math. Every uh, introductory grad student does the math on a stellarator and say, this is all I need to do. Um, I just need to make a mag uh, magnetic coil in this very complicated shape. And then fusion will happen. Um, however, doing that in practice is actually quite quite challenging. So maybe you could speak a little bit more. So the, the Stellarator and the Tokamak, what's the difference between those two? They're both magnetic fusion systems. And then what does Helion do? The Tokamak and the Stellarator are both magnetic systems. Their goal is to generate this magnetic field and hold on to the fusion fuel long enough. Like I mentioned, these charged particles are trapped on the magnetic field. In fact, they're oscillating. We call that a gyro orbit, is the radius that they oscillate around the so that right there, you just saw the images. That was the those fusion reactors. So what's the difference? Well, the fusion reactors that uh, helium is doing are can produce much more dense plasma because their beta is a lot higher and their pla and their magnetic field strength is going to be higher. So they're going to be able to produce a much more dense plasma than those reactors are going going to. Now we can kind of understand why have we not had fusion for so long? Because we've been going about it the wrong way. In fact. I'm off on basically every other form of fusion that's out there. If they're not doing a high beta concept, I have zero faith. And that actually includes Commonwealth Fusion. I don't know what's going on with Commonwealth Fusion. You guys can make your own judgments based on that. But I don't, they're not, they're working on like tokamak type styles. So I don't see how they can achieve the level of efficiency that David Kirkley is talking about in this video too creative with the terminology we call the technique that helion uses magneto inertial fusion because it does a little bit of both so to understand that we can actually go back in history a little bit and think about the evolution of some of these approaches to fusion and so from our perspective we look at the technology that we use as built on physics experiments that were very successful in the 1950s um, and in those systems the earliest pioneers of fusion said i know we understand the physics we have to take these gases heat them to 100 million degrees and then confine them push them together so that fusion happens and so what is the best way to do that so the, some of the earliest programs we call them the theta pinch and what those programs were were a linear topology because we know how to build these magnets uh, it's called a solenoid where you take a series of electric coils you run electrical current through them that generates a magnetic field great so you have a magnetic field now you add your fusion particles okay so you've added fusion particles to this solenoid Here's the challenge. Those particles, as they're sitting in that magnetic field in this nice magnet, escape. They leave out the ends because there's nothing holding them in. Great. So that makes sense. Um, and so that doesn't work. Okay. So then the next. So great. What do we just learn there? First of all, he goes, people were working on this in the 50s. Wow. Yeah. I mean, the, the podcast hasn't dropped yet, but the Jason Giorgiani podcast is about to drop. And you're going to learn about... Uh, What's his face? Ronald Richter. Ronald Richter, 1953, 1952. This stuff goes straight back to the 50s. And then, like, his research got classified. They said it didn't work. They're like, nah, don't worry about Ronald Richter. Don't worry about his basically a neutronic fusion reactor that he's building. Forget about that. And then they started trying to do it. And then what we're going to find here is that the research, I did my own research, those uh, slides or those uh, websites I was showing you guys. And this science kind of just got defunded in the 80s, in the late 80s. So they were doing this science into magneto inertial fusion. And it just kind of went by the wayside for some reason. And then David Kirkley shows up in the 2000s. And and uh, what's his face? Uh, uh, the guy that worked with Richard Eskridge, uh, the other the founder. But these guys show up, and now they're picking it back up again. So I was already convinced that this stuff went back to the fusion bomb and our research in the fusion bomb. And now we're drawing even more parallels. And it's also connected to plasmoids and EVOs. You're about to hear David Kirkley talking about plasmoids and EVOs, the very same thing that Ken Shoulders was talking about, 
the very same, the Marauder program, guys, the Marauder program in the 90s uh, that went classified, they were shooting plasma toroids at each other. That's what helium fusion is doing. That's literally what their reactor does. <laughs> I can't believe this. I'm just sitting here going, wait a minute. So did it just go dark? Is that the secret that this whole area of research, all of this magneto inertial fusion, it went dark because it was all being classified under the uh, nuclear weapons secrets. And it went dark and it partially got defunded because nobody knew what it was or what it did. People are like, you know, you can't talk about it publicly. You can't be like, hey, man, we made some weapons and they're just manipulating space time. By the way, they're based on the H-bomb. People just look at you and they would just laugh. They would be like, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, you're doing Star Trek. Uh huh. Are you going to put on your Star Trek clothes and go to the convention? That's what they would say to you. 100 percent. So it gets defunded. And then I don't know exactly how it picked up. But now I'm starting to see like this is what the deep state is. No offense to David Kirkley. I don't care if you're deep state, guys. They think I'm deep state now. Um, but this is what the deep state is, though. The deep state is a group of people that know about weapon secrets that even the public doesn't even really believe are real. And they're profiting off that knowledge. Computer technology secrets, microelectronic engineering secrets. You would call it gravity manipulation secrets, fusion, plasma, topo topological research, all of it. They're all profiting off of it. And they know the other people that know. And then you have a club now. No individual is actually evil. They're just driven by their own incentive structures. Okay, I've ranted too much. Here we go approach to say well one one branch of fusion said okay well to solve that why don't we take this solenoid and bend it around let's just make it a big donut so as they're escaping they go around and around in a circle great that's a great approach and so one branch of fusion went down that direction and and that became that evolved into the stellarator and the tokamak different ways of taking those solenoids and wrapping them around so that the plasmas go around and around in that magnetic field and our whole, those charged particles are held long enough that fusion happens but there's a different way to do it and so the theta pinch was what was born in the 1950s of take this magnetic field and oh they're trying to escape great let's not let them escape let's close the bottle mm -hmm. let's close the ends and so we make the magnetic field much stronger at the ends this one was called the mirror i already knew what he was going to say here if you guys watch my if you guys watch my content when he says this here he goes okay the problem is the plasma is escaping we try to do a theta pinch the plasma is escaping out well we already know the answer to that is let the plasma escape bro use it as propulsion use that as your propulsion use the use the exhaust uh, but we knew the answer. The answer is a mirror, mirror configuration. Remember the mirror? And remember what else is good about the mirror? The mirror is also, also used to produce a free electron relativistic laser. We produce mirrors, have them vibrate, and you can speed up. You can create a particle accelerator. You can make a laser or a X-ray laser, essentially, with it. So I think the byproduct of them producing these fusion reactors that are mobile fusion reactors is that they produce x-rays. They give off x-ray exhaust.